This is Bloomberg Intelligence. We're really getting into now the streaming arms race. This is looking at that and saying we can really build a nice niche for ourselves. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The dollar is the dominant concept in the planet. I think the acquisition is a natural progression of what Microsoft can do with this technology going forward. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Over the next hour, we'll dig inside the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global markets. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. Today, we look at the return potential for Alphabet as it trades at a steep discount. Plus, we'll find out why recent booster data doesn't bode well for Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. But first, investor demand for mortgage-backed securities may increase with option-adjusted spreads having widened more than what fundamentals would suggest. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence MBS strategist Erica Edelberg. All right, let's talk about the mortgage-backed securities business. We know we've got rising interest rates. The Fed is intent on raising rates. What does that mean for the MBS market? For more on that, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence MBS strategist Erica Edelberg. So, Erica, talk to us about what's going on in the mortgage-backed securities market. Well, I think as probably almost every potential homeowner knows, the rising rates in the rates market has pushed up mortgage primary rates as well as mortgage-backed security yields dramatically this year. This is for you know a couple of different reasons. We tend to track mortgage general treasury rates, but also because the Federal Reserve has stopped adding mortgage-backed securities to their portfolio. They had been supporting that market. And as a result, spreads have widened out a lot versus treasuries. On top of which, as interest rates have risen and uncertainty has risen, there's been a widening in spreads in general in mortgage-backed securities in relation to uncertainty about the direction of rates, as well as hedging needs for those mortgage-backed securities. So where do you think the next move might be? I mean, is the sense that they've spreads have gotten too wide and maybe this market will correct a little bit and we'll see the spreads come in? Yeah, there, there's two things. Both both rates seem to be experiencing a bit of a correction. We had gotten all the way out to about 430 on the 10-year, and we're now actually back below 4%. And that is taking mortgage yields down a little bit with it, which is probably a good thing for people looking to lock in mortgage rates. But also, we are seeing spreads tighten a little bit. We came in you know, very wide versus what we would consider fundamentals, given what our models would expect when you look at housing and economic fundamentals. And we've already tightened quite a bit since then. We've gotten out to about at the wide, about 180 basis points spread to treasuries. And I think we're inside of 170 now. I think we're around 165 right now. So there's some reassurance going on in the mortgage market, it seems, and some buyers are willing to come back in. We learned a lot about the mortgage market from the the great financial crisis 2007 through 2009. Can you give us a sense of the credit quality of the market these days, of the typical issuer? Because that was just a driving issue back in the crisis. Right. There, there are two strong positives for the sector right now from a credit perspective. One is that credit standards have been much higher, but also the type of instruments, the type of mortgages that are being lent out are a lot better from a structural standpoint. Most mortgages now are 30-year fixed. There's a growing increase in interest in adjustable rate mortgages, but even those have a five-year fixed period as opposed to a teaser rate that, you know, you could decide whether to pay your mortgage down or not, those pay option arms, uh, the pre-financial crisis. So both structurally as well as credit-wise, I I think the market's in much better shape. And then, of course, most people who do currently have homes have a huge amount of housing price appreciation in the bank. So they have probably only about 60% loan to value ratios right now, which means that it makes it much less likely they'll say walk away from their loan than they did when they were actually underwater when housing prices fell, you know, pretty significantly in say 2007, 2008. So I'm looking at the IN Go function that's a Bloomberg index browser and just shows me kind of some year to date returns for a lot of the various fixed income categories. Boy, uh Mortgage-backed securities have not been able to escape any of the carnage in fixed income so far in 2022. Is the expectation that when we do come out of the other side of this, when we start to see the market improve, that MBS typically outperform or underperform other parts of the fixed income space? I mean, you're exactly correct. Actually, as of October, mortgages took the rain as the 
worst performing <laughs> of the uh, Bloomberg aggregate bond in, in the C, uh sectors. But, you know, again, that's a lot. Of the reason is because they are so interest rate sensitive. I think in answer to your question, the real question will be, what is your outlook for credit for corporate bonds going forward? Are we going into a deep recession? Even there, most people that I've talked to think if we are going to a recession, which is not that unlikely at this point, it's going to be relatively shallow and, you know, most companies will probably be fine. But I could see the corporate credit related markets having a harder time in that environment. And at the same time, there could be some flight to quality in mortgages. We do also expect mortgage supply has already come down dramatically. It's about a third of what it was when all the refis were going, refinances were going on, you know, in 2020, And on a net supply basis, also, especially if home price appreciation does moderate, we would expect net supply for mortgages to be lower. So that could be a bit of a tailwind, we think, going into 2023. The flip side for that is just, you know, there's also lower liquidity in the sector as there is less new issue flow and as so many of the more season bonds are tied up in the Fed. So, you know, lower supply is a positive in the long term. In the short run, it could create some liquidity issues and spread volatility is always something that is difficult for investors to want to, get involved in. All right. Good stuff. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence MBS strategist Erica Adelberg. Coming up on the program, we talk Alphabet and its 100% return potential on its bonds, despite the plummet in the longest duration bonds. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 13 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Alphabet's longest duration bonds have plummeted, falling towards 50 cents on the dollar. But despite that, its financial flexibility and credit ratings have never been stronger. For more on what this means for the company's return potential, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence senior credit analyst Robert Schiffman. Rob, I can't believe Google's bonds would fall so far. I mean... They've got a lot of equity under them. There's a ton of cash flow, ton of free cash flow. Should I not just go out there and buy them? I'm getting two for one. Well, listen, it's been a pretty ugly time, whether you're a tech equity investor or a bond investor. I think there's it's a little bit of a misnomer, though, from the credit side. Yes, bonds have fallen to 50 cents on the dollar, but the reality is most institutional investors, and institutional investors are the ones who own the vast majority of big tech bonds, they hedge treasuries. So the actual dollar price isn't so much what matters, because dollar price is affected by interest rates and duration. Um, It's really spread that matters, and Alphabet spreads are still amongst the tightest in the corporate bond universe. That said, if you're a retail investor, and you're thinking about dabbling in the fixed income markets, you you can buy a bond that's yielding almost 5%, that has near zero default rate, and effectively, you're getting two for one at 50 cents on the dollar. So, it really depends on the type of investor you are. Either way, Alphabet's credit has never been better, and we don't think that there's much risk in the name. I mean, I'm looking at the FA function on the Bloomberg terminal, but, you know, I'm seeing basically, you know, it's still $100 billion in cash. They only have like $29, $30 billion of debt. $100 $100 billion of free EBITDA, $60, $70 billion of free cash flow. I mean, this is triple A, right? Well, it's a double A name. It sounds like you know the numbers pretty well. You're going back to your old analyst yeah, days. You're, you're going to scare me that you're going to know that much more than I do. <laughs> but yeah, listen, it's not just a super strong, strong credit. I mean, when you actually think about it and dig through the numbers, they have a better balance sheet, I think, than anyone in the corporate bond universe. Even Apple, everyone looks at, at Apple's cash number, which is now $170 billion plus. But when you think about credit, you have to think about net cash, yep. how much cash you have relative to your debt. And Alphabet's net cash is the highest, um, meaningfully higher than Apple, meaningfully higher than Microsoft. And it's likely to stay that way because names like Apple are looking to go net cash neutral, which means they want to have the same amount of debt as they do cash. So I think uh, Alphabet's balance sheet is actually the best in the business, um, You know, even though they're only at AA right now. So for Alphabet, if they wanted to go issue 
debt today, they would have to pay a lot more than they did, obviously, before the Fed started raising rates. I always ask you the question, why would Alphabet or, or Apple, for that matter, or any other big tech names be issuing debt? And your response was, because it's always so cheap. But today, we're not going to see that, right? Um, no, I think you might see that for, for Alphabet. Really? Okay. Listen, I, w- when you think about it, listen, why do companies buy back stock? It's because they don't have anything better to yep. do with their money. And the return on the buyback is meaningfully higher than just keeping it in the bank. So I think you're going to consistently see larger and larger buybacks. Alphabet recently boosted their authorization to $70 billion. I'm not so sure why next year that authorization can't go to $100 billion. And the way that you can keep increasing it is by borrowing more. So listen, rates are higher, the cost of capital is higher, but think about it. They're not actually thinking about the pure cost of capital. They're thinking about their weighted average cost of capital, the cost of debt relative to equity, and it's still pretty close to zero. Mm -hmm. So if you think big tech is going to be out of the borrowing game, I think think twice. You're still going to see a significant amount of borrowing. It's not so much Mm -hmm. that they need the money. It's still the best use of capital allocation and uh, efficiency from a capital model is to borrow and buy back stock. All right. Well, we've just had a slew of big tech earnings and generally disappointing across the board, you know, whether you're in the digital advertising business or whether you're just a more of a software company, uh, like a Microsoft, a little bit of a disappointment, and we saw that in their stock. How's your market? How are your institutional investor clients thinking about, you know, the credit in the tech space? So, listen, it really depends on which part of the business that you're in. We use tech as sort of this broad catch-all, but every tech company is really meaningfully different. And even some of these large social media and advertising platforms have much different components to what drives revenues and cash flows. If you're in a pure advertising business, like a meta, uh, that's much different than, say, a search business uh, for an alphabet or certainly a software business for a Microsoft or a hardware business like an Apple. So people are positioned differently. That being said, credit quality across big tech, whether it's Meta, Alphabet, uh, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, I think has never been better. Ratings have never been stronger, and spread volatility has remained reasonably low. The reason why you don't necessarily see people pouring into bonds of these big cap names right now is that nobody's pouring their money into anything. They're keeping money in cash. Um, But the risks of this sector are extraordinarily low. You know, I hear you talking all the time, every single day, about risks of default Mm -hmm. and the high yield market and stress in credit. Uh, You're not seeing that. A, an investment-grade credit. B, you're certainly not seeing it in large cap tech. If anything, the place to run and hide and park your money until you have better ideas are all the names I'm following. So despite these huge declines in equity prices and even the huge declines in debt prices, again, those are more duration and rate moves than have to do with spread it and credit risk moves. You know, I think this is a super, super safe haven. Um, and if people are looking to add exposure to anywhere in the market outside of cash right now, I think tech is, is likely to outperform on a credit side over the next six to 12 months. Is there one from a spread perspective that jumps out at you? You know, it's really a, a barbell style approach. You go up in credit for names like Apple and Microsoft because you just don't believe there's going to be a lot of spread volatility. Or you go down, I think, into the triple B space. Names like Broadcom or Oracle that have gone through large Mm M&A and have leveraged their balance sheet um, trade meaningfully wider than a typical triple B. But most of the bad news, I think, is out of the way. And they trade so much wider. And they're deleveraging. And oh, by the way, the financing that they need for these deals, they're starting to term out with banks rather than to pump into the bond market. So technicals are getting stronger. So I think if you move down into some large cap, triple B tech names, um, it really matches up well with a higher quality portfolio. All right. Good stuff. As always, our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Credit Analyst Rob Schiffman. Coming up with the program, we discuss the troublesome data facing Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna's latest booster campaigns. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 25 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. 
take a step toward bringing our country and community together. Start a meaningful conversation at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. We'll be here each and every week at this time, tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts covering some 2,000 companies in 130 industries worldwide. The first human data for Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna BA's 4 or 5 vaccines calls into question the use of bivalent shots in the latest booster campaign, especially when it comes to new sub-variants. For more, we're pleased to welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Pharmaceutical Analyst Sam Fazelli. So, Sam, give us your thoughts here. There are some booster shots in the marketplace. The uptake seems to be fairly muted at this point. What's the science tell us? The science is telling us that we've got a situation where um, bivalent shots from Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna are being used. Um, and there isn't an enormous amount of data to guide us as to how good, how useful are these going to be uh, in terms of their protection against infection or disease as we go into the winter. So as you rightly said at the beginning, you chose to go and get one, and I it's absolutely up to people to decide what they want to do with this. Safety-wise, these things appear to be still as safe as they were right from the beginning. So the question really here is, which is something that's worrying me a little bit, is that we might have vaccines that are not going to do a phenomenal job, giving people four, five, six, nine months of protection, and then eroding public trust. I've had four to date, so this would be my fifth shot. Do I think about it that each shot is more or less kind of a six to nine to maybe 12-month kind of coverage at some level? So that would be what we hope, at least 12 months. The problem is we're using what what are these bivalents, and especially with the Pfizer-BioNTech one, data for which was not presented at the FDA or the CDC meetings. So we don't really know what level of antibodies they produce. The two bits of data we've seen so far have told us that there is an amount of antibody that's produced, which is no different or maybe slightly different than what we've got with the original shot. The problem, Paul, is we've got to think about, well, it's not just the vaccine and your antibodies. We have variants and and continued mutation of the virus, which is not at all a surprise, producing uh, sub-variants that are, we don't know how much they'll be affected by these vaccinations. Maybe you get great cover, or maybe you get no cover, which is what I'm worried about. My approach is kind of like, there really isn't any downside other than maybe having 24 hours of kind of feeling a little sluggish or something, which some people have reported, or maybe even a little bit worse. Is there any downside to taking a booster shot at this point? You know, you can never say never for any material, any medicine, any vaccine that you get, you take into your body because you, you just don't know for 100%. But as I said, the data that we have so far keeps suggesting, you know, 19, nearly 20 million of these shots, probably 24, 25 million have been delivered in the US. No major noise of any problem yet. So that's one thing. The risk, Paul, is that they don't work very well. And you'd get yet another load of people saying, look, I don't see what the point is. I'm not going to bother anymore. That's what I'm worried about. The public health aspect as opposed to the individual angle. I think I'm characterizing this correctly that in the U.S. the uptake has been much, much less than what it was in prior dosage. Is that similar in the U.K., Sam, or or in other markets where it might be available? Yeah, no, U.K. folks, I think, are more... Um, kind of roll up their sleeves a lot easier than uh, than right. in other places. UK has always had high vaccination rates. But even here, I'm pretty sure, when you look at the Office, Office for National Statistics data or the data from the UK um, Health Security Agency, it's not going as, as well as you would have hoped uh, with the others. And I think that's going to be expected. And I think, Paul, that's why Pfizer-BioNTech are talking about pricing of $110, $130 for the private market because they're expecting a reduced amount of demand to just, therefore, you make it up for with price if you can. Where are we in terms of the discussion of herd immunity? Just take the United States, for example. Is there some level of herd immunity that has been achieved? I would say yes. But the question has always been, this is a virus and your immune system is the same immune system as ever. You are going to get infected again. 
if you don't do anything. I mean, you can try and go and get these every three months, these shots, to try and see if you can cover for it. But that's really not realistic. The point is, we can see very clearly that we don't have a run on hospitals. We didn't have a run on hospitals during Omicron. Nowhere near the sort of situation that we had at the beginning. So you've kind of got the, a, a good background of immunity protecting people against severe disease, which is what the point of this vaccination had always been. Make this a less severe disease. Now, I'm not belittling the idea of uh, long COVID. I'm not suggesting that catching it and being in bed for a couple of days is a bad thing. But it's just like the flu vaccine. We don't take the flu vaccine so we don't catch the flu virus. We take it so we don't end up in hospital. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Pharmaceutical Analyst Sam Fazelli. Coming up on the program, we turn to ESG, where companies with a higher CO2 ambition are raking in the capital from investors. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 39 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Companies with higher CO2 ambition are more likely to attract capital from ESG investors. They're also more likely to benefit from further investment as those funds grow. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence senior ESG strategist Shaheen Contractor. So, Shaheen, I know you got a research report out on this. What is CO2 ambition? Sure, Paul. So it's basically companies setting more carbon reduction, setting more ambitious carbon reduction goals. So that's really measured by our BI carbon scores, uh, which basically forecast companies' carbon emissions till 2030 and uh, those that are aligned with sort of a Paris warming temperature benchmark. So CO2 seems to be, to me at least, one of the easier things to address for a lot of companies because it just seems like I can kind of see it, measure it. And there's technologies to kind of limit it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, but also I think when it comes to climate ambition, so carbon reduction goals, that gets way more complicated because companies are setting these carbon reduction goals across different business activities. So comparing them, all that remains a challenge still. I'm looking at your report here, and you've got utilities and airlines and things like that. Um, so they have pretty ambitious CO2 reduction goals. Do we have any sense of, are they on track to meet them? Can we measure if they're meeting them? So, Paul, the report, what it's doing is it's saying that, you know, companies with more carbon ambitious goals are actually included in more ESG funds. So, it okay. actually matters. That's what ESG investors So, if you say about. you're going to reduce CO2, I'll invest in your Correct. company. Correct. Okay. <laughs> it's ambition. Okay. I think, you know, all these companies have recently set these goals. So, measuring preparedness and ability to meet them is a whole other ballgame. If I'm a big company and I say I'm going to reduce my carbon, is my auditor going to check that out or who's going to check whether I'm doing that? So I think a lot of it is self-reported, right? Oh, Especially boy. these carbon goals. We are having sort of SEC regulations have uh, promoted disclosure, but when it comes to carbon goals, I think it's still the Wild West. Though what this report does show is that it does matter to investors. Companies setting more carbon reduction goals in terms of you know ambition are actually being factored in more ESG funds. What are some of the key drivers, aside from CO2, that ESG investors really value? Like, what's important to them? <laughs> it's a mixed bag. And to be honest, you know, that's why we did this analysis. Yep. That's because... ESG can be 300 different metrics, but we want to see what matters when it comes to ESG, what leads to greater fund inclusion. So we, it was very clear we divided you know, high ambition, low ambition using our BI carbon scores and found that ones with more ambitious goals were included, well, had an ESG fund inclusion rate of 24%. So that means ESG funds that hold the stock divided by all funds. So one in every four funds that hold the stock is an ESG fund. Okay. In the ETF space, another mm -hmm. acronym. Yes. Has the ETF space embraced ESG as a strategy or a factor? Oh, very much, very much. I think everybody sees this, you know, sort of almost like an accelerated trend when we look at asset growth. ESG ETF asset growth has definitely slowed this year, mm -hmm. especially in the US. Right. I think Europe has sort of taken on its lead again, which it lost to the U.S. a little bit in the middle, and it's continuing to show strength, especially in Europe, all okay. driven by regulation. So I, I first heard about this ESG 
issue mm -hmm. probably 10, 15 years ago from European institutional investors. They seem to be ahead of the U.S. Now I hear and read a lot more about U.S. funds and U.S. ETFs and things like that. Is it Europe still kind of ahead of the U.S. in, in, in kind of really thinking about and implementing ESG as, a, as an investment strategy? Yes. So Europe, if you look at ESG ETF assets, uh, so Europe was about 49%, so clearly the majority. The U.S. sort of ramped up from 17% as a share to 34% as a share, but it sort of stayed stagnant. That was like this two-year spike, and yep. then it stayed stagnant. And so Europe has taken us back. Asia, not big uh, into A yeah. little bit, but I, I feel like that still has some way to go. What's the next big thing in ESG investing? Is it better data? Is it better adoption? What's kind of the holy grail for ESG? It's regulation now. I mean, everybody, uh, till now, ESG was sort of the wild west. I want to call my fund an ESG fund because I think what goes into it in e is right. ESG. Now regulators are stepping in. The SEC is doing a lot. Uh, in the UK, you have new fund disclosure guidelines. So there's a lot of that. All right, that's good stuff. As always, ESG is still a growing part of the investment pie. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior ESG Strategist, Shaheen Contractor. All right, let's turn now to natural gas sentiment, as U.S. prices are expected to fall short of forecast. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior U.S. Oil and Gas Analyst Vincent Piazza joins us now to explain. So, Vince, let's start with nat gas here. Where are we in terms of the nat gas market as we head into this winter heating season? Well, I think we're in very good shape uh, in terms of storage and in terms of um, natural gas production heading into winter. So, you know, we see nat gas prices uh, for winter closer to six bucks, five fifty to six bucks, and that's uh, below analyst forecasts that were around seven fifty ahead of our. Uh, research release, but they're now closing in around seven bucks. So they're starting to uh, consolidate. The biggest issue is um, how warm will winter be? And we think uh, that winter will be warmer than expectations. And so draw season, we're roughly going to have, by our estimate, a little less than two trillion cubic feet coming out of storage. And that'll leave us somewhere around 1.6 trillion cubic feet at the end of heating season, which is fairly close to the five-year high, and that should leave prices somewhere around the 550 to $6 handle at the end of uh, the winter season, which traditionally concludes around the end of March. So that's a little bit surprising to me. I was just kind of operating on the impression that there's not a shortage, but that supplies were tight. There's not a lot of incentive to drill and do all that kind of stuff politically, if not economically. How did things kind of evolve over the last several months? So what we have found, especially in places like the Haynesville, Marcellus, and associated gas from the Permian, production is quite strong. Um, and it's getting stronger because of the efficiencies and because of consolidation. We recently hit a new high, a new all-time high in production. Uh, in the month of September, that was eclipsed in October. We actually have one day where we had over 105 billion cubic feet of natural gas production. So very, very stout, robust natural gas production that should continue into year end. And this will lead to very stout, resilient production into 2023. So we're fairly confident about the production signals. Weather will be the biggest driver for winter. Winter is the biggest driver for natural gas for the entire year, actually, because of the length of the season. So if we take a look at where we see January and February, those eight weeks are the most critical season for natural gas draws. And we see January and February as quite strong, but not as strong as history. So that's why we think this season balances will be somewhat looser. And that's why we think we'll have storage at the end of the season closer to that five-year average. So, Vince, I'm, th I'm thinking geopolitically here globally, our good friends over in Europe, boy, it sounds like they could use some nat gas. Can we send it over there or we don't have the capability or they don't have the capability to receive it? So right now, greenfield capacity for LNG exports from the U.S. is really maxed out. We're not going to see new capacity until most likely 
sustained new capacity um, into the outer years of the decade. But really, for this winter season, Europe looks in pretty good shape. Storage is closer to 94% full. That's a huge improvement over the summertime. And in fact, storage is well above the five-year average. So they are in pretty decent shape at the moment. And perhaps with their conservation initiatives and their price caps, they can control the dynamics this season. Next season is a different story. And we also saw that in prices, and we're still seeing it in prices as those prices are turning down at the title transfer facility, which is the Henry Hub equivalent benchmark in Europe. Okay. So can the world, in a longer-term scenario, operate without Russian energy? Well, I think it would be very, very difficult, but a lot of the growth in LNG is coming from friendlier domiciles. Right. The U.S. is a leading uh, provider of LNG exports. Uh, In fact, it has significantly grown its capacity and will continue to grow its capacity over time. We have the transparency of those projects and how much capacity will come online. Uh, We also have capacity in other parts of the world that could subsidize um, any um, capacity lost from a less friendly Russia. And Vince, I know you were down in Houston recently, uh, you know, the epicenter of the U.S. energy business. Any takeaways? Yeah, so I think the industry understands the uncertainty and the dynamics in the industry today. And so discipline, capital discipline, production discipline will likely continue into 2023. I think the hallmarks are robust free cash flow. Look for higher fixed dividends. Look for higher supplemental dividends to complement the base dividends. And even look for an increase in share repurchases because Hmm. the balance sheets look a lot better this time than last cycle. All right. That's great stuff. As always, Vince Piazza, he is an experienced strategic oil and gas analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Love getting his perspective. That's this week's edition on Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 57 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.